Well, we have um, the great Jason Brashears on uh, today. So I'm going to hit record and we'll fire up the podcast. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner and I'm here as always with the wonderful and technologically advanced Dr. Bear Paul Lando sitting in his beautiful studio there. Um, Coming to you from the great state of Jefferson on the Smith River here. Uh, spring is in full effect as we actually move right into summer. It seems like we don't really get springs in fall anymore. It's just pretty much long winter, long summer uh, with the grand solar minimum uh, in full effect. But um, loving this weather, going to get a little bit more rain this weekend. And the boy, the older son and I are going backpacking tomorrow, Bear. We're going to do an overnighter, our first one. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, and uh, everything's going wonderful over here. We thank you guys for all your support. If this, you are new to Alpha Vedic, check us out at t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic on Telegram. That is a fantastic community, t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic, or on Discord at alphavedic.com forward slash Discord. You can find out all of our information at alphavedic.com. That's A L F A V E D I C.com. Best way to support us is buy our products. They support your own health, your health, uh, keep your terrain uh, fit for the times that come. Our teas are exceptional, the best in the world, I'd say. So go check those out, as well as all the other products that Bear has put decades and decades of his expertise into. Uh, and we uh, are getting so many wonderful testimonials about the products. Feel free to check those out on the site. Speaking of testimonials, Bear, the flowing um, positive testimonials are coming in from last weekend's Music and Sky. Uh, glowing reviews. I will be posting some of those to the Telegram. Our, our friends Scott, Garvin, Ashley all sent me amazing reviews uh, and testimonials, um, and it was just a wonderful time. So thanks to everybody coming out and supporting that last weekend, and we will be announcing the larger festival uh, date soon. Uh, anything else coming on your end, Bear? No, I'm just uh, stoked to get into this day, uh, this uh, whole episode here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Jason uh, really brings it, and uh, I'm a full-time student of Jason University right now, so uh, I'm uh, really enjoying being brought back to school here. Um, so let's get into it. Go ahead, do cool. your intro, and uh, we'll get started. Cool, cool. Yes, I'm very excited as well. And the thing I lo really love about Jason is as someone who I've, I studied history at UC, the thing that we, of course, learn even in the traditional uh, side of uh, academia is go to primary sources when studying things, right? And Jason gets that. And he's been doing that for over, what, 20 years, reading primary documents going way back, not just watching YouTube videos and extrapolating content that way. He believes in going to the primary source I look forward to talking a bit about that today. Jason has been blowing my mind for the last two to three weeks. So this is going to be a really, really fun talk. Jason Brashears imports his vast knowledge of the occult, hidden historical cycles, and profound mysteries today on AlphaCast. We're really looking forward to this one. Um, we'll discuss the pre-flood world and how it foreshadows coming events, the Zodiac as an apocalypse decoder, and prophetic information from ancient texts, including the pyramid, uh, Giza. Uh, that's just for starters. I mean, we could go anywhere. Jason's uh, material goes so deep and so broad and on over so many things. I mean, really, this could be a 10 hour talk. We're going to try to stuff as much as we can in a couple hours here. Uh, Jason Brashear is from archaics.com, and that will be in the show notes below. Brings his extraordinary research on the role of artificial intelligence and the history of the human race trapped in a false reality simulacrum. Quote, we are more than we suppose ourselves to be, fantastically powerful, able to escape dungeon programming, recognize negative default programming, and create our own reality, end quote. Jason's information is for those unafraid of the dark who want the truth undiluted and direct. The ancient past, behind-the-scenes happenings throughout all time periods, censored histories, the academic cover-ups, real facts about race, religion, subversive societies, and even psi-based predictive systems of analysis by which future events can be known beforehand are uncovered and explained on his channel. Rashir's research goes deep to penetrate through the layers of deception to unveil new concepts and discoveries about the ancient world, its people's beliefs, civilizations, and the catastrophes that ended them. 
life events that fuel Jason's passion for the truth to stay the course on his arduous path is equally remarkable. He is a stonemason by trade and owner of Paradise Rock Gardens, where his expertise here has allowed him to appreciate the impossibilities we find in the archaeological record. Jason believes that we are existing in two different realities simultaneously. The collective, which is scripted and includes events planned and executed beyond human ability, ability to alter, and the personal, where we can individually be immune from and separate from anything going on around us. Join us today for this fascinating journey, which will most certainly require many sequel episodes. Bear Lando, uh, this is a fun one. Take it away, sir. Yeah, this is right up our alley. You know, this is our first talk together, Jason. And first, thanks so much for being here. You're very popular these days, and we appreciate you making time for us. And, uh, you know, I know your channel is uh, archaics.com, your site, as well as your YouTube channel is growing quickly as it should, but not quick enough because, you know, you, as I said before, you bring so much uh, to the table, so much authentic research. And, uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion that half of what you see on the Internet is kind of BS. It's just people, you know, parroting at each, each other. So, uh, you know, here um, at... Uh, in our little operation, you know, we do real functional things. We do functional medicine uh, based on what works, functional agriculture. I have a chemistry lab where we use old school alchemical principles. And in those endeavors, you get to really see how all the different aspects of nature, including the simulation above our head, how it all plays in, creates the residence of our reality and how we can actually take charge and start creating, you know, having a, a bigger part of this rather than just thinking that we're, you know, victims of this whole thing in the first place. So, uh, so much, I, I almost don't know where to start here, but, um, you know, your education was uh, amazing. And I'd like to really have you, if you're, if you care to uh, share how you came about all of this information, uh, how it got started. You know, I kind of envy you in a way because I always hated school uh, very early on. I intuited that it was uh, a lot of bullshit <laughs> that I was being taught, you know, even in medical school and uh, spent a lot of my adult life unlearning things. And, uh, you know, when I hear you talk about you, I had access to, um, you know, libraries from 116 different institutions that go back, you know, maybe a couple hundred plus years where you have old old school stuff. You know, I was listening to one of your things lately and, uh, you know, I got the Pliny, uh, the elder, you know, I was always aware of these, but you mentioned it in one of your, uh, I don't know if you're seeing this here or not. Hang on. I can see you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, I got the whole set. So I'm really enjoying going through all these and, and I, uh, you know, always, go for the old books myself. But um, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, your education was, you know, from source material, not just Googling stuff. Uh, I have a whole list of topics here that I, you know, hope we can kind of touch on. I know there's a lot the pyramid timeline, the Phoenix phenomena, uh, simulacrum, uh, you, you know, the way you have determined through mathematics, we're on a flat plane, but how it also explains how we perceive things as curvature. Uh, you know, that's a whole topic, and I, and I don't want to get lost into the whole flat earth thing. Um, there, there's one group out there, FPV Angel, who I really love because they bring a whole different third paradigm to the table rather than just getting in a superficial flat or round kind of discussion. And I think if you don't already know about those guys, you, you'd also appreciate them. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe talk a, a little bit about how Russia, uh, you know, and current events, you know, figures into the whole thing. And, you know, it's just so many topics. But um, maybe let's just start with the uh, your history and then touch on the simulation. You know, we're big on the simulation here because I have a background in uh, waveform physics and I approach it from that angle. And uh, long ago uh, through those studies, I came to the conclusion that this has to be a simulation. And uh, you have the whole historical documentation of why that is. 
uh, who's controlling it and so forth. So a lot of uh, other interesting things I'd really like to learn about. So, uh, Jason, thanks again. And maybe if you could just start a little bit about your personal story and how you got here. Okay. Well, uh, try to keep it as concise and abbreviated as possible. Uh, I spent a long time in prison from 17 years old. And uh, I learned really quick that there is literature, there are books that are basically floating around cell blocks and tucked away in closets and in uh, prison basements, uh, former libraries, books. I mean, they hardly throw anything away from the administrators. They just tuck these things away. And, and I, I could not believe the wealth of information I had access to. And it wasn't just the books that I found in prison, but once I had begun my, my journey on, on, on reading all these like original source materials, like you mentioned, Pliny, Pliny's Natural History, then I wanted to read Lucretius. I wanted to read everything about Thales and Anaxodrides and Anaximander. And I wanted to follow these. And I realized that these Greek, these Greek sciences, uh, sciences, which were basically copied by Roman writers, that I've read all of Cicero as well and Tatian and Tacitus. And when, when I follow this back further and further, and I find out that, that there's a, there's a 3,000 year old text by St. Croniathan, who was a Phoenician historian. I get that, and I read it. And uh, other guys in prison also took up interest, so they were using their own uh, resources to order books as well. Then I got in contact with benefactors who were finding out what I was doing, and they started sending me books. I would find even more very old books in different prisons, and I joined the prison lending uh, library program. Then I became a librarian, and I had access to all 116 libraries in the Texas prison system. I was able to move books just by mail. Uh, then I hooked up with a guy named Paul, Paul Tice, who is the publisher of Booktree in San Diego, and all he publishes are very old reprints. His catalog is fantastic, and I offer it in several my website in several different places. But once I got a hold of his catalog, it was over with. There's about 600 books in that catalog that I ordered, and some of them he sent me for free when he realized what I was doing. And in fact, he sent me my first six publishing contracts. Uh, my first, my first six nonfiction books were all published by him. So it's a uh, the journey was like 19 years, about 19 years. I didn't start this way. I mean, I, it took an adjustment period as a 17 year old kid thrown into an adult environment. I was a knucklehead for a while. While I got more time while I was serving. While I was serving a prison sentence, I got more time, but I, I was basically a product of my environment. Things were going on around me, and 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 by necessity, I had to join in. So uh, as years passed, though, I had pretty much isolated myself from the rest of the prison population, and I just in, I just started internalizing everything, and my my uh my focus was trying to prove that my belief system was legitimate. I tried to set out to prove that the Old Testament was real. And that's not what I found. And the more the more I studied history, I realized I can't do this without a system. This is entirely too much data to to not try to put into some type of system. So the most obvious system that I came up with was was chronological. So I decided to organize all my thousands of pages of notes and, and into a into a, a cohesive timeline. I called it Chronicon. And it's already been through like five different revisions. Uh, the one I have now is 510 pages, and I give it away free in PDF files on my Facebook Archaics group in the file section. But that's a lot of PDF files for someone to download. It's much easier to download just for a couple bucks off Gumroad, uh, and a lot of people do that. But this, uh, this, 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 basically, this deep dive into history revealed multiple different things to me at the same time, but I wasn't really ready to receive some of the findings. Although I'm really good at object objectifying what I find and setting it aside and compartmentalizing it for the future and just putting it in files away, they, they, they continually nag at me, things I am finding. And I found not just repetitive patterns, but I found the exact same sequence of events unfolding in different civilizations in different time periods. But in the calendar that was used by that civilization, it was the same year as the same series of events and in the same corresponding year of another civilization. And when I started finding these patterns, I started cross cross checking them with everything I knew in other civilizations for other calendars that were operable then. Then my, my research took on a whole new dimension. I really, really wasn't worried about sequential events. I still recorded everything chronologically, but now I'm looking at calendars and trying to figure out what kind of dynamic would allow for this to happen. What am I actually looking at? 
So I studied about 40 to 41 different ancient calendrical and timekeeping systems, and I found discovery after discovery after discovery after discovery as if the collective is heading down a series of reality tunnels that's 100% scripted and that events are manipulated, programmed. And uh, this led to another series of events. Still, though, even though I'm recording all this in my chronicon and I'm showing the arithmetic and how impossibly precise these timelines are, I'm still not on simulation theory. I'm still, I'm still attached to this Newtonian physics BS world that's been foisted upon me all my life that the media still perpetuates today. So uh, I didn't make these, I didn't actually make the jump to simulation theory until my research was basically concluded and I was going through all my files and, and, and looking at everything that I had discovered from resets and mud floods and, and cross calendrical parallels, isometric projections in the thousands showing that, that events in the collective could have easily been predicted. All we had to do was know the script. All we had to do is look at the individual years and begin measuring, but nobody was doing it, so nobody could predict them. Predict them. So these methods I show over and over and over in my videos, how these things could be predicted. And uh, and there's been several videos that I've released where I did, I use the exact same methods by which I show history unfolded, and I show my viewers, look, I, I can predict these things. So in 2000, I mean, in the year 2000, 20 and, and 2021, I released a series of videos predicting all, all kinds of things. Like dur during Australia's driest season, I was predicting that, hey, next year you guys are going to get flooded out. It's probably going to be the worst flooding season Australia has seen in 100 years. Nobody believed my video, but any Australian will tell you today that's exactly what happened. And there's a series of videos about Thailand, uh, thing, uh, political situations in Canada, uh, all kinds of things going on in America. And because once you've isolated the pattern and you see it operative throughout all of history, it's easy to know the future. It's easy to see it. It's very, it's very patterned in the collective. I'm not talking about the personal. I'm not talking about you personally. I'm not talking about any of, any of our listeners. I'm not talking about me personally because individuals being immortals cased in rat, basically physical trappings inside the simulacrum, we are we are totally independent and yet still inside this construct. And I know it's very difficult for people to understand that, but we are basically a universe unto ourselves and we and we create circumstances. But we're also like a minnow in a river. That minnow has great, great latitude to go where to go left, right, up and down, go backwards, go forwards, can go all the way to the terminus and the edge of the river, can go with the flow, go against the current but that minnow can't survive outside the river. We are inside a collective continuum that's heading toward a terminus, but we are, we are, we are billions of ethereal, ethereal sparks, tiny little universes unto ourselves. And this is my primary message in, in archaics, but none of this was, was sought for. I was looking for, I was looking for trying to prove the old Testament is true. Instead, I opened up a Pandora's box of all kinds of things. I never would have imagined I would have found. So uh, if you don't mind another personal anecdote, um, you spoke, I heard one time about a, uh, an event, a motorcycle accident, actually, that uh, brought a, a moment of uh, lucidity uh, where okay. that's kind of where you made the shift into the, seeing the simulation. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Then we'll get more yeah. into some nuts and bolts. Okay. Um, I thought I had all my, all my I's dotted and all my T's crossed. And I was going to start a YouTube channel. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to start releasing all my data and all my information in YouTube videos. This was my plan. But it was go. But I was going to release all the information on the Phoenix, the Phoenix chronology, Nemesis X object, everything I learned, just basically all my studies of all my life, I'm going to release it on YouTube. So I set out to do that, and I recorded and released one single video. That video was Weapon in the Sky. And it's all about the Phoenix, showing the patterns of the Phoenix till, till, till the year 2040. Now, it's a 35-minute video, 45 minutes, something like that. It's data-packed, but it was my first attempt at a video. And it's kind of it's kind of primitive, but it's still one of my, my most watched videos. But uh, I released that one video, and as soon as I released that video, I had a, I had a terrible motorcycle accident. I had rebar go through my leg. I, I went to ICU. Uh, I had a little surgery done on me. My bike... Uh, Progressive insurance had to pay for eight thousand seven, eight thousand three hundred and seventy or eight thousand seven hundred and thirty dollars in new parts because I wrapped my bike around a concrete pylon. 
Uh, I landed upside down in the air, and uh, I don't remember where the rebar got stuck through my arm, but uh, I didn't roll or slide or anything. I was upside down in the air, and it was just a it was a it was a total body impact. Uh, uh, upside down on a concrete pylon underneath a bridge in a construction site, and and I just slid down and hit the ground, and I got right back up. And I had people leaving all their cars in nearby traffic running out to this field. And I just remember, it, I mean, the whole thing is, is still clear to me. I just remember how interesting it was that all these people were coming to me. And I remember talking to them. And I remember a, a Hispanic guy taking off his shirt and a woman took it and she started wrapping my head. And I couldn't imagine what was going on. I didn't know that my clothes had been ripped off of me. I went through a fence. I didn't, I didn't know all that. So I'm, uh, She's wrapping my head. I don't know I'm covered in blood. I don't know that I'm hurt. I don't know anything. I look over at my motorcycle, and, and in my mind, it looked fine. And when I talk to these guys, hey, will you do me a favor? And, and uh, my bike shouldn't be laying down. Will you please set it up? And I remember how curious they looked at me, even though three of them went over there and they picked my bike up. I didn't know it was a total wreck. So uh, I don't know if you know anything about motorcycles, but the tree on a fat boy is a huge steel stem with four giant bolts. That holds the handlebars and fat boy motorcycles are like a thousand pounds. It's a huge bike. Tires are real wide. Well, my tree was bent in half and even the Harley dealership couldn't believe it. They, they couldn't believe I was still alive. And, but while I was standing in the field talking to people, I was so interested in them. Each person that opened their mouth, I was just, I was in, in exchanging dialogue. I was standing up erect. I was just fine. I wasn't hurt or anything. And to me, people were so interesting. And it was just this level of detachment. And they were all surrounding me. And I remember pulling my phone out and I called my sister and she answered. And I said, hey, I'm probably going to the hospital. I don't know how bad I'm hurt, but uh, uh, I just had a motorcycle accident. I'll talk to you later. So they asked me to sit down. Once I sat down and complied, things came rushing to me. And I guess I blacked out because when I woke up, I was in the ambulance and a woman was looking into my face. And I tried to get up and she stopped me and I asked her what time it was. And uh, she told me the time and I instantly told her, uh, damn, I'm missing 17 minutes. So she reported this to the ER and, and uh, she told the, the ER that this exchange had happened. But uh, I was released from the hospital, went back, had my bike re rebuilt and all that. But never have I forgot how awesome it was to feel the way I was feeling at that moment. It was, so uh, I was me. I, the personality of Jason was there. I was, I, I was me and I could feel my body, but there was absolutely no pain. I was no discomfort, no pain. Later on, now, it took me over 50 days to heal. I was bedridden for a while and it wasn't because of the rebar going through my leg or the lacerations from the fence ripping <clears> my clothes off. It was because the impact had sloshed all my internal organs. Uh, I, it was a perfect upside down body impact on the concrete. All my internal organs had had, had basically been stretched, and uh, I had to I had to do a lot of. It was hard to breathe, hard to eat, hard to swallow, hard to talk. Everything was really hard about two days after this this incident. But but mentally, this entire thing changed my whole perspective. It changed. Uh, my my very next video was on simulation theory. And I never intended on that. Simulation theory wasn't even on my map. It was, uh, uh, I, my first video, my first video doesn't even hint of it. It's just about the Phoenix. But my second video, I go into detail about simulation theory and how I'm gonna wrap all my research around this. And I made a series of promises in my second video explaining that, look, I'm gonna show you how the history of the world's unfold. I'm gonna show you these mathematical protocols, cataclysm protocols, all the things that are operative throughout our collective existence. I'm gonna show these in a series of videos. And I've lived up to those promises. That video was two years ago. But uh, yeah, because uh, my time on YouTube has not been, it has not been at all uh, a, a, a continual engagement. I would, working full time, I would, I would go four or five days without releasing a video. Then I release a video, totally forget about it. I'm not really engaging in it. It's just something I'm doing. I got I got 300 subs. I had it took me almost two years to get a thousand subs. Once I hit a thousand subs, it took me about four months to get to two thousand subs. And then it just started. You know, you hit you hit that. Uh, I started hitting a tipping point where I started rising. Santos Bonacci was the one that really propelled me forward. One one interview with him, and I, and I just. My increase was exponential after that, but the, but the motorcycle, <laughs> yes. the motorcycle incident, 
100% changed my perspective. It put all my research into a context I could wrap around now instead of a bunch of independent discoveries like I intended on my, my, my YouTube channel to be. Now my YouTube channel was going to have focus. It was all behind me getting real hurt, real bad with that motorcycle. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I asked that question. Go ahead, Mike. I was just going to interject. Well, no, you go first because I have a couple touch points on this, but go ahead, Bear. Okay. So I just wanted to hear that story because, um, you know, understanding it from my perspective, you know, our, uh, you know, our whole simulation is a product of electricity. And we talk a lot about that on our station here. And just our very consciousness is uh, two polarities and where it meets the ground and what we think of as ourselves. So one of the polarities are neurology and the neurology just being one pole of our being. But when you're just in exclusively in that neurology pole, you're uh, actually experiencing yourself as the simulation. Whereas when you have an event like you described, all of a sudden it shifts you. So you're not stuck on that one polarity and you're removed from it. So you can just perceive it. And it's not a mental thing, but it's, uh, it's a whole experiential phenomena where now you're, you know, you're seeing it more for what it is, even if your mind doesn't understand it. So I just want to touch a little bit on that. And um, Mike, you go ahead and um, with yeah, what you were going to say, and then I wanted to get a little bit into some of the timeline factors. Yeah, just a quick note on that. I feel like transcendent, transcend, transcendent moments in our life streams typically happen from a, some trauma. And I wonder if that trauma is played out in the simulacrum um, in a way that's either conducent to uh, a benevolent a benevolent entity leading us that way, or if it's our own, in essence, the minnow, as you're saying in the stream, our live stream taking us there for a reason. And a quick, quick story. I worked with Mark Farner from the band Grand Funk Railroad when I worked in Hollywood. And he has a similar story that changed his life where he was 18, 19 years old. And he wouldn't care if I told the story. He's told this in public where he was driving very fast on a country road, lost control of his vehicle with his friend, uh, was going way too fast. Uh, actually, a, a kid came out uh, randomly out of nowhere in front of him on a country road. And, and in order to avoid the kid, they went into a cornfield going like 75, 80 miles an hour, right directly towards an oak tree. He saw his life flash in front of his eyes. He knew he was like, I'm gonna die right now. Closed his eyes, something happened, transcendental experience, open his eyes he is now 100 feet past that tree and is fine the, the car has stopped they look back and somehow they they didn't hit the tree the the police were called they come the detective comes they can see the tire tracks going up to the tree stop there on the other side of the tree continuing on and then there was a eyewitness who was there and saw something, saw the whole thing happen she swears to God it was an elderly lady says she saw the, the car going at the oak tree it disappeared, it reappeared on the other side and it continued on. Crazy story, changed his life. It sent him on a whole different path of spirituality and understanding what his life path is. He wasn't meant to go then. My question is then, I know this gets really deep and weird and metaphysical, is like, if we are in this simulacrum there, did something hack that so that his life stream could continue because he had a specific you know, path or hero's journey to take or was there some glitch in the matrix? Either way, that that bit of trauma and that experience totally shaped the rest of his life. And, you know, then he goes on to be a major rock star and all these things. So uh, interesting side note, but um, that does tie into a lot of fun questions in regards to how this reality works. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, my, my interpretation of what happened is is pretty it's pretty focused. Uh, I'm pretty confident that what happened to me was that for whatever reasons, like I said, the trauma, the accident, whatever reasons, that I was experiencing very te a temporary separation from my avatar. Because my whole, my paradigm uh, would have to be understood by people for them to understand exactly where I'm going with this. It's uh, our avatars 
basically chain us to the central nervous system. And our central nervous system is a filtering system. It filters out information. It does not provide us information. It's filtering out things optically. It's filtering out audio. It's filtering out olfactory. It's, it's, it's filtering out all kinds of things in order for us to be able to sequentially process the timelines that we're experiencing right now. What happened to me felt like I was divorced from my avatar or the link that locks me into my avatar was weakened temporarily. And I was feeling this euphoria of who I really am. And there was no pain, there was nothing, but there was a great awareness of not only who I am, but also a, a an intrinsic, basically curiosity about everybody around me. And uh, I believe that these bodies that we have, they're necessary for us to move through this continuum, but that necessity is also like a chain. It's a it's a very it's a very heavy vibration, and that's not what I was feeling at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we could use this to segue into more into the simulation and uh, and the possibility, I think it's more in the possibility, but that other entities or forms of consciousness have hacked it and trapped us into a false simulation. And uh, maybe uh, by explaining, uh, you know, the pyramid time timeline that you go into, how the pyramids are um, geometric calendars that, um, you know, you can go forwards and backwards and, and, and understand things that way. And uh, always in multiples of 138, and that gets into a lot of your work there. But if you could maybe help, uh, help us wrap our minds around how all of that works and how it fits into the simulation. Oh, well, there's so, there's so much there. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, sorry. There's a, there's a lot there. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to start with that. And so, well, I guess the easiest way for me to start was that I noticed that a series of events kept un, unfolding in human history in different geographical areas. And I read a reference in the Jewish Haggadah years ago that says the angel of death appears every 138 years. So when I read this reference, I got a calculator out. I pulled out all my Chronicon notes, which were already in sequential order. And I just started looking at all, all these events that I had highlighted in yellow. I had a color coding system with my with my uh, Chronicon, uh, my Chronicon notes. So in yellow, I had all kinds of natural disasters and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm looking at all these dates that are highlighted in yellow. And that's when I realized Damn, these are all in multiples of 138. It might not, these events may not be 138 years apart. They might be 276 years apart or 414 years apart or 552, 690, 1242. I could go on and on and on. But in every incident, these mud floods, these resets, this liquefaction and flux tube phenomena events, these great cataclysms that happen in different areas of the world were all occurred in multiples of 138 years. I couldn't ignore this. I, I had to post these findings in, a, in, a, in an entire book. I had so much data showing this that my publisher, when I, when I, when I tried to send him the original manuscript, he was overwhelmed. He said, hey, you know what? Can you, can you abbreviate all this into a book that I can publish quickly? So I, I did, and that book is called When the Sun Darkens. It was released in 2007. But waiting for the release of that book, I had acquired so much new information because now I knew what I was looking for that I had to release a second book called Nostradamus and the Plants of Apocalypse. And this one goes into even more in-depth material about all the ancient monuments, ancient texts, every this, this awareness in the old world of this 138-year periodicity and the actual phenomenon that was responsible for, which was the Phoenix. And I go into a lot of detail about all the censorship that occurred. It seems it seems like the governments of the world going back a long time since Roman times were always trying to conceal this data. And so this opened up another can of worms when I realized, wait a minute, I have actual historical dates and, and events for several times when the Phoenix phenomenon was predicted with absolute accuracy. It wasn't just Thales of Miletus who predicted it, but the Danan, the Tuatha de Danan, when they invaded ancient Ireland, they used the Phoenix phenomenon to their advantage against the Firbolgs. And the Firbolgs, the, the, the native like gigantic people that were living in Ireland were so discombobulated when, when the Danan 
Uh, when the Danian invaded in mid-May of the year 1135 BC, the Firbolgs didn't know what to do. When the sun turned dark, there was an earthquake, the sea was tumultuous, and, and the Danian burned their ships and invaded. And all the same thing the ancient Israelites did to the Canaanites, the Phoenix phenomenon happened then. Stones fell from the sky, the sun darkened. The entire account is written in the book of Jasher. So we have a uh, we have all these incidents, even even a uh, 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 even in the excuse me, even in Zechariah Sitchin, who I'm a critic of Zechariah Sitchin, but that doesn't mean everything that he's ever published is something that's not not worthy of value. One of the things I noticed in one of his books was that the Anunnaki before the flood had totally predicted the event, and he describes it in detail. And I thought I found it really interesting that the Phoenix, because the Phoenix phenomenon is the reason why the vapor canopy collapsed. It's the reason why the ancient Americas began the four suns calendars and that we're going to enter the fifth sun period, which is apocalypse. It's the reason why the ancient Nordic people were all the only thing they feared because I mean, these are historical documents to talk about. Even Alexander of Macedon interviewed people from the far north, the Scythians, uh, and and he basically asked them, what is it you people fear? And they told him the day the sky falls on our heads. This ancient tradition that goes back to the day the sky fell, the, uh, the, the, the sun calendars, the collapse of the vapor canopy, it's recorded in the Bible over and over. It is called the Great Flood. And it's the third in a series of floods that the old world had, had experienced. But it's the most popular. It's the one everybody knows knows about. The Great Flood of Noah happened in the month of May, which is uh, uh, 2239 B.C., which is really interesting. I don't want to go into those details in here because we don't have the time. But on my own on my own channel, I show that even in 1998, a whole consortium of scientists from all different fields had agreed that something so catastrophic had happened in the year 2240 BC. And that's an approximate within one year, which is a scientific bullseye. But they all agreed that in the year 2240 BC, something so catastrophic had happened to our world, it had reset every single civilization and probably probably killed off about 85% of the world. So uh, I, I'm not the one to wow. publish this. This, this was Frank Joseph. Frank Joseph has released these scientific reports in his own published books. And uh, I found those really interesting since the Phoenix chronology and since the chronology of Emmanuel Velikovsky, the chronology of many different uh, uh, U.S. cryptologists, R.A. Boulay, uh, the chronology of Stephen Jones, biblical chronologist who uses the Assyrian eponyms. Everyone agrees across the board that that event was 2239 B.C. So which is interesting because that's on the 138-year Phoenix periodicity. So this is what tells me, because I keep seeing that throughout history, every 138 years, this phenomenon occurs somewhere in the world. Now, it's also very discriminating. There are civilizations it leaves untouched. There are others where communities are almost totally wiped out. And then in sometimes in whole communities that are wiped out, there are still survivors that tell us that they were among the elect and they record it. And then we have things like the Colburn Bible. We have the Orlin Dutch manuscript. They, these, these old manuscripts have common denominators. They all describe Phoenix phenomenon. The Book of Jasher is another one. Another common denominator of Mother Shipton's prophecies. Another common denominator among these old texts is the fact academia does not support them. And yet they can't disprove uh, their, 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 basically their veracity. It's, uh, it's almost as if there is, a, there is censorship for a reason. There are things that, that academia does not want us to know about, about the ancient world. There are fragments and pieces in the Nag Hammadi text that talk about the phoenix. There are two different Gnostic texts in the Nag Hammadi Library that specifically mention the Phoenix and what it is for. It is keeper of the calendar, and it's to knock the Archons down. And the Archons are the ones that control the elite, because there's always ruling families among the earth that serve the Archons and do their do their bidding. So, uh, this is one of the main one of the main veins of my research is the Phoenix phenomenon, but it's not the only one. It's only one cataclysm protocol out of a few that I have published. And so and Diana, having, not go ahead. Well, I, like I said, I, I totally, totally lost sight of your original question. So you're going to have to, keep <laughs> me, you're going to have to rein me in when I go too long. So about something. no, no, you're uh, no, this is fantastic. Uh, I had a couple things. If you could just uh, run us through a little bit more of the mechanics of the vapor canopy, 
um, how that was altered exactly. I, I'm, I'm, I get the gist of it and the significance of that alteration. And then uh, second part, sorry, I always throw too much at you here. Um, the Anunnaki, uh, I'm understanding from some of your work, they're more of a recent Caucasian uh, that's exactly oriented how they're race. Described. Yeah, they're exa that's exactly uh, how they're described in historical records. Very tall, uh, bearded looking. Yeah, they and that's heads? distinct from in archons uh, uh, being a distinct, uh, different, uh, different, not to be confused with Anunnaki. Right. Oh, uh, archons are taken from the Gnostic concept, but the Gnostic mm -hmm. concepts are basically borrowed from older sources. And mm -hmm. these are these aren't gods. These are like servants of the gods in the Judeo-Christian deal that would be called, I guess you would call them angels and demons, whatever. But from a simulation context, it's totally different. With artificial intelligence X running the show inside the simulacrum, then the archons take on a different form. While I'm speaking in prim primitive metaphor and I'm speaking from primitive frames of reference because that's how the historical record conveys it to us. But from my own personal frames of reference, I now understand that artificial intelligence X has taken taken the place of the demiurge. Artificial intelligence X has seven main servants, which are cataclysm protocols. They govern over all the all the mishaps that happen in the collective. Uh, they're lords of time. They 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 manipulate timelines. They induce resets. They do all all these type of things. But from the old frames of reference, yeah, they're they're angels. They're demons. They're demigods. They're there are forces of nature or whatever, but from the simula from, from simulation theory context, I understand what they are. They are, they are actually uh, programming protocols. They may act with sentient. They, they may be sentient. I don't know. AIX is, or it believes it is, but, but returning to your original question, you talked about, you want to know about the vapor canopy. I can sum that up yes, pretty quickly. Please. I can sum that up pretty mm -hmm. quickly. We have records of people on, on this world who remember a time when there was no moon in the sky. They remember this. They also remember a time when the sun was very, very far away. It wasn't bright in the sky like it is today. Now, suddenly a cataclysm happens and destroys this world. But the world that is destroyed by all the inferences we find in the historical record and the traditions was a very technologically advanced world. It is not the script that you're taught, you're taught in college. It's just the opposite. It's not the uniformitarian, gradually evolving, becoming who we are today model that's perpetuated in academia today. It is just the opposite. We have a we have a uh, a technolithic period, very high sophistication. That civilization is totally wiped out, and the survivors basically record the tradition that the pre stellanites were destroyed. The survivors are small colonies of people. And this is discussed by Emmanuel Velikovsky, but you really can't go to his research. You have to trace his source materials to Hans Boringer and to Hans Bellamy from 1901 and 1902 that were putting these books together. They're fantastic. But the pre-Selenites were wiped out, technologically advanced. They were right here in this world. And suddenly, after, after the skies cleared, there was a moon in the sky now at nighttime. In the daytime, the sky never cleared. Now there was this thick, this thick firmament, this oceanic type uh, hammered glass effect that magnified the stars at night. But during the daytime, it was a solid dark purple light. This went on for over 1,656 years. In the book of Genesis, this period is called the pre-flood world. It is the antediluvian world. There was no, there were no sun calendars. There's no sun systems. The, uh, uh, the zodiac was not based on, on on a solar mythos at this time. It was all it was all lunar. It was all matriarchal, and it was all stellar at this time period. That's why the older zodiacs are always stellar and and lunar based. It is the it is the the zodiacs that came late in antiquity are all solar, and that's because the vapor canopy collapsed in twenty two thirty nine B C. Then the rainbow was, well, then, you, then we had the prismatic effect of the rainbow, which had never been seen before. But in the, uh, the vapor canopy is not something that, that I invented or, or even really discovered because six books before I even came onto the scene, six 
very scientific books about the vapor canopy world have already been released. And I have a video on my channel about them. I name the authors. I show the book covers going all the way back to the you know, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s. These books have been released. In Glen Rose, Texas, today, there is a biosphere, a very large uh, containment biosphere has been created by the scientific, uh, I think it's a creation, creation Research Institute, where they have replicated these vapor canopy conditions, and they have grown fruit flies and cockroaches and frogs to extraordinary sizes. They have also uh, basically triplicated their longevity made them live three times longer by trying to replicate this uh, uh, increased oxygen, this this uh, total filtering out of all UV, UV rays. And that's what the vapor canopy would have done. It would have been about six miles thick layer of water droplets that were suspended high in the atmosphere, which we know of right now as the mesosphere. We already have a vapor canopy up there. It's all, but it, right now it's only at about 0.01% of its original capacity. It's collapsed. The thin layer that's up there now is scientifically known as a mesosphere. But in ancient times, that mesosphere was miles thick. And Genesis is very clear. In the book of Genesis, it says that every single morning and every single evening, the sky basically rained a dew. And what, there was no rain. There was no storm clouds. There was none of that. The, every evening and every morning, the all the herbage and all the plants were watered uh, from the sky. This also created a vast magnification effect where the ancients could look up in the pre-flood world and at nighttime they could see stars, they could see the luminaries far greater than we can today optically. Uh, I mean, not with, I mean, we can better with telescopes, but they could see it with the naked eye. It was a magnifying lens. But during the daytime with the sun on the outside of the vapor canopy, we had the situation of a solid sky that was dark purple, and you could never see where the sun was located because of the light diffraction. It was just a lighter sky. Then the nighttime came, and, 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 the, and the vapor canopy collapsed. This went on for 1,656 years until the Phoenix phenomenon collapsed the vapor canopy and ended that time period. Once that happened, humans quit growing to astonishing sizes. Animals, flora, and fauna quit growing to a astonishing sizes. Trees didn't grow 400 feet tall anymore. The entire world changed in a single day in the month of May in 2239 BC. Vapor canopy has been gone. Well, I, I've also read in other sources that that vapor canopy created a uniformity of temperature and subtropical conditions throughout the entire plain. And, uh, you know, which would account for everything you're talking about there. So, um, well, actually, this is just to speak on that, what you just said right there sure. is the exact uh -huh. it's the exact reason why we have old world maps of Antarctica. We have maps of island chains that are today covered in one and a half miles of ice in the Arctic. Well, what you just said is the exact reason that Charles Hapgood and other researchers have published these old maps, and you can see what the original terra firma was below the ice caps. It's because at that time period. We were, we were far more advanced. We were already mapping. Cartography was an old science. They had already mapped the entire world. But the world that we have it now for thousands of years is covered in ice at the extremities. So uh, that, that's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, the world so, was one temperature, so that ice was not there. So basically the world was one large greenhouse. And it's funny that they have inverted that to have us fearing the greenhouse effect, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> nowadays. Um, so what was... I love I've, I've listened to some of your videos on the vapor canopy and it's mind blowing. It's such an interesting concept. What um, what was the civilization if we wanted to, you know, that was here, the pre diluvian or what, a civilization at that time in your mind, who was on the planet? And was this when supposedly what I you know, the Book of Enoch calls the Nephilim were here and all of these things, these giants and all this stuff. And then also what kind of fauna did we have on the planet? Because that's not that long ago. Um, and so are we talking about megalithic animals and stuff like that? And then where's the fossil record for that? Well, uh, the La Brea tar pits, the peat bogs in Florida, we have many examples of North American plains where the bone yards are of megafauna and human remains mixed together. It's a we have we have a lot of evidence that the three-toed sloth, the large ibex, uh, several different species of megafauna and humans coexisted. 
one of the greatest archaeological finds ever ever found is also one of the most suppressed. Yeah, that's in Mexico where they found 30 at Acambaro, they found 35,000 terracotta and clay figurines of humans interacting with gigantic creatures and megafauna using them for steeds and all kinds of stuff and there's no way that's possible unless humans were actually doing it to get these creatures to be anatomically correct in in their uh, in their statuary you know it's not the only one william niven found the same thing in like 19 uh, late 1930s and 40s that was highly suppressed uh, we have a lot of documentation uh um from different sources on the fact that humans have coexisted with very large large creatures but humans themselves have also been very very big now i'm not the i'm not the guy that's going to tell you that giants existed like the like, like the jolly green giant but we have detailed information from many historical records even outside the bible that humans were known to be nine foot and nine and a half foot tall even goliath in the old testament was nine foot nine inches tall is it we have Smithsonian records going back. Well, we actually have many records going back of the newspaper and the microfish. Yeah. If you look at the microfish from the 1830s all the way to 1921, you're going to find hundreds of gigantic human remains that have been found all over North America, centrally located also in Cahokia, where we find mastodon, mammoth, and three-toed sloth remains, megafauna who were being hunted by the people who built the pyramidions of Cahokia. They were coexisting. The smoke pipes that they were smoking out of at Cahokia, humans now, those pipes were made from mastodon bones. Now, this isn't the picture that we've been given by academia. Academia tries to tell us it was 35, 40,000 years ago that humans were hunting these, these mammoths and mastodons and all that, and they weren't building, and humans weren't building architecture. They were living in caves or small huts that were half buried underground. But that's not the picture we find in the archaeological record of Cahokia and the entire Mississippi, Ohio Valley civilization. These, these uh, pyramidions uh, maintained very advanced trigonom trigonom uh, I can't even say it, trigonom tr trigonometric values. Many people like William Cordes of the Source Book Project has published entire volumes about Cahokia and show that only a very advanced sedentary race of people could have built this place. It's huge. Yeah. But That's it's great. Huge. That's great. You mentioned that, Jason, because I often get in these conversations with the more academically minded folks uh, that are, you know, in our scene. Um, I'm thinking of a few names right off the top of my head, Bear, I won't say. And they say there is not a record <laughs> showing that there are, uh, even if we want to go only 12,000 years back or, you know, uh, after the Ice Age, of um, there is not a geological record of an agricultural, sedentary, uh, advanced species of human until, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, three, four thousand, three thousand years ago or 3000 BC or about that. And I always I am challenged with that because if you just look at a Becky Tepley or you look at, um, you know, in Peru and, and some of these ruins, um, it, it just seems like, and we'll get into this, into the Phoenix phenomenon and how these cataclysms work, that there's something almost more uh, mythological or or something more for in uh, shifting the reality structure in a way that um, they're not factoring in and why and also the cover-ups too right the smithsonian all these people covering up the data but i i love to hear more about this because uh it just gives me more ammunition for my theories about how yeah we've had a lot of advanced cultures going way i would say millions of years even well i'm a i have i have I have restricted the archaics data to 5239 BC because that's the oldest date that I can come, I can actually find a reference for in old calendar systems. And that happens to be in a Nuna calendar based off 600 year periods. And it comes with many, many sources. But I can't go further back than that because I have absolutely restricted the archaics data to the historical record. I don't go any further back than that. I'm strictly, I'm strictly a chronologist. Now, I admit that yes, there are some many anomalous things that go back further than that, but I don't, I don't really entertain them. I only, I only, I only, all my videos stay within that context from 5239 BC all the way to the present day. The, uh, I don't entertain the younger Dryas period, the Ice Age period, and uh, I have shown a tremendous amount of data 
for anybody who wants to see it in my videos and in my published books about the like, like the Atlantis scenario of 9,500 BC, how that's absolutely in error. I am not saying that there wasn't a technologically advanced civilization at that time period. I don't know if there was or not, but I do know that the Atlantis scenario is based off a of misconception of how the Egyptians were recording, were recording time on a lunar based system, not a solar system the Greeks were, were, were used to. And, there were, and, and this was addressed by Eudoxus and other people 300 BC who were criticizing Plato even in the day that Plato was alive. So you're absolutely incorrect. It says this was a lunar system and they only count months in Egypt. Those 9,000 months mean the entire Atlantis story happened in the 13th century BC, not 9,500. And it couldn't yeah. have happened in, it couldn't have happened in 9,500 because the the whole war between Atlantis and the Greeks presupposes that a Egypt and a Greece would have had to have been existing and they did not exist in 9,500 BC. So it's a, yeah, I have to stay within the historical record. I can't disagree that those civilizations didn't, didn't antedate that, but it's not the focus. I, I just can't, I, if I can't, if I can't cite a source, I can't, I can't go to it. And if we, uh, if we go back to the vapor canopy and if we're on the ground in contemporary, uh, you know, circles, carbon dating things, that's going to throw carbon dating right out the window as well, right? Well, the, uh, the breakdown of carbon isotopes over thousands of years is going to be, is going to change. There's no doubt, but mm -hmm. it depends on how far back through the vapor canopy you're talking about because carbon 14, mm -hmm. I know it has a lot of critics. It seems to be very, very reliable up until about 3,500 BC. Beyond that, it's ridiculous. Beyond that, beyond that, the mm -hmm. readings get so wild, they're just in inconceivable. But uh, I'll give you an example. Carbon, uh, over 60 carbon-14 dating tests were all independently conducted off, off over 60 different samples just from the Great Pyramid. They took pieces of pieces of the of the uh, of, of stone from uh, you know it has it has a uh, it has a very unique mineral compound that's been found in the uh, uh, not the cement but the mortar because you know the mortar most people don't know they think it's just a pile of bricks but it's actually the mortar is one fiftieth of an inch thick and it's stronger than the actual limestone that that it binds and it, it's fantastic it's got unknown uh, mineral properties we're not really familiar with how they made it it's uh it's basically it's probably geopolymer but uh they've taken over sixty samples of that from all around the pyramid inside and out and those 60 samples came up with 2800 bc plus or minus 50 years now, that's pretty accurate for that many samples to, to, to all do that and um but you're right you can't they use carbon 14 dating to just try to say things are 40,000 years old 30,000 years old vapor canopy in the context of human history was a very short period of time but you're right yeah. Uh, you're right. A vapor canopy is going to totally alter the findings of, of not even that, but radio the uh, potassium radon dating, your potassium argon dating, all your relative dating methods. They they are all laden with so many preconceived notions, especially that these isotopes uh, break down at the exact same ratio over periods of time, and it's just not true. We've had we've had all kinds of astronomical events that are inexplicable that could have heightened or increased that activity. It could have increased that radioactive breakdown. We've had things appear in our sky that stayed there for 18 months, like in the year 1054. In the year 1054, there was no nighttime for 18 months. This is very well documented in many history from China, from, from the ancient Orient all the way to Europe. It was widely known. Now we know, well, well, we don't know this. We don't know this, but our scientists today tell us that it was an explosion in the Crab Nebula and uh, a supernova that occurred, and the light, the light, the light just basically lit up the night sky for 18 months. Okay, that is an ex post facto interpretation. There's no scientist alive today who could, who was actually there when it happened. All we know now is when we take a picture of the Crab Nebula, it looks like an explosion. Well, we don't know if that's what it was. Because remember, we're living in in a simulation, and it can produce whatever optical phenomena that it needs to produce to fool whoever it needs to fool. So all we know is that in 1054 to 1055, there was no nighttime. It was total daytime in night and, and, and day. So I'm like, it probably was a Nova. I don't know. But that event could have altered uh, 
uh, isotopic breakdown. That alone would have would have affected some of these carbon fourteen readings and, and potassium argon ar- argon readings and all that. Because we even know other relative dating methods that are absolute BS, like dendrochronology. If you go look at the science books from fifty years ago, they they touted dendrochronology is an absolute method to date all kinds of volcanic eruptions to date earthquakes to date all these things and dendrochronology whole whole books were published about dendrochronology and then in the 90s some scientists get together and publish a report showing that all of it's bullshit it's all wrong because now we just figured out that a tree produces two rings a year for both wet seasons not one ring but did yeah. any of those you know, scientific books get redone what about all the scientific conclusions that were put out in other fields of science using that as their data nobody went back and rewrote all that material this is the subject matter of a book that you can you can read for yourself called evolution cruncher it's 800 pages but it's worth your time it shows you how every single relative dating method is absolute bs it show it shows you all the fossils that have been found that completely overthrow every scientific paradigm the book is fantastic. It was written by scientists, but they're not being listened to today. It's even better than Michael Primo and Richard Tom- Thompson's Forbidden Archaeology, which was boring as hell, but it's data packed, basically showing you that the history of the world that we've been taught is not the history that we've actually lived through. Yeah. What, what was you that know, book, uh, what was that book again? Sorry, Bear. What was that first book you said again, Jason? I'm writing, okay. I'm writing the, copious notes. <laughs> the Scientific Foundation has put out a book called The Evolution Cruncher. It's over 800 okay. pages, and you can actually get the book for 6 or $7. So I was just going to say from my perspective now, it almost seems like some of Sitchin's work is deliberately keeping us in a false narrative. I don't know what his motives or intentions were. I guess it doesn't matter. But since there's so much confusion, um, you know, through that in the role of the Anunnaki, I, I want to go back to that if it's okay, just for a second. Um, you know, what is their origin? You know, it seems like they suddenly appeared on the, the scene there. Um, can you shed a little light about their, their origins, uh, the role that they actually played and, uh, you know, their genetics uh, in the first place? Okay. Um I can't, I can't really get off into their genetics too much. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not a mm-hmm. Anunnaki authority, even though I do have like 40, 47 or 49 videos in my Anuna files about Anunnaki history and all that. It's, it's not something that I, I really claim to be an authority of. It's the information is basically just falling into my lap by virtue of all my other studies. So it wasn't something I was going to ignore. I went ahead and put that narrative together too, because it does fit in with world history and it makes a lot of sense. But, uh, we have the situation of the Sumerian records, which were accurately translated by, by, by Zechariah Sitchin at first, as he showed over and over and over that the beginning of the historical narrative to the Sumerians was 432,000 units before the flood, and that all Anunnaki and pre-flood history happened during those 432,000 units. We know from historians over 100 years ago, like Samuel Noah Kramer, who have published that the word shar was a, was a unit of measurement. Because even ancient ship captains on their manifest, which we found in cuneiform tablets, we have found everything that was in a ship's cargo measured in shards. This tells us it's a unit of measurement and not what Zechariah Sitchin said. Sitchin said it was a year. So we're looking at 432,000 units of time. Well, when you compress that by the draconian calendar by which the Vedic system All the Vedic Yugas are divisible perfectly by the number 360. All the Bactans and ancient Olmec and Mayan and Quiche systems are all divisible by the number 360. The uh, uh, the Sumerian, all the all the Sumerian kingless dynasties are, are are divisible by the number 360. So the ancient year in the vapor canopy period was 360 days. So 432,000 shores would have been 12 centuries it's just 1200 years this lines up perfectly with a, cro- a cro- the chronological values provided by manatho manatho said there were three great dis- disasters three great cataclysms and he shows how they are how they are distributed 
the exact numbers of Manatho comport with this 1200 years. This 1200 years would have been 3439 BC, which is exactly 1200 years before the great flood and collapse of the vapor canopy. So this period of 432,000 years, we can abbreviate it into a, a, a much, uh, so much easier to understand and comprehend. It also makes sense. Let me give you an example. During this period was a 241,200 unit period where seven kings ruled over five, the Pentopolis. The Pentopolis of Bat Tibera and Shurapak and Larak and all these Sumerian cities, these five principal metropolises were governed by a dynasty of seven Anunnaki rulers. These seven rulers ruled for 241,200 units. Now, if we're, go if we're going to interpret it by the way Zechariah Sitchin interpreted it, then you're going to have to suspend your disbelief and actually believe that a ruler could, could rule for 80, 85, 95,000 years each. That's ridiculous. It's so preposterous that <laughs> it's offensive to even, to even imagine that. But if you go by common sense, the base denominators of the Vedic system, the Sumerian system, the Egyptian, all these old Babylonian systems was the base denominator was 360. If you divide that number by the days of the ancient year, 360, you're left with a perfect 670 year period. Seven men can rule on, a, uh, on the dynastic throne for 670 years. That's quite easy. So my question then on the Anunnaki going to Bear's question, um, so are you familiar with the Anunnaki or the, if I'm saying it correctly from, um, from the Sumerian tablets, I guess it's the original, I guess you could almost call them the Elohim, or I know that's been translated to the shining ones. And, um, are you familiar with that translation at all? And I'm wondering if that's different than the, what we've come to know as the Anunnaki, oh. you're saying the Anunnaki are more just like the king. Okay. The well, okay. We have. The problem, the problem we have in divulging this material is that people get racially triggered when they hear when they hear what the historical record conveys, and uh, it's really I, I have addressed this in my Anuna Files videos. But Thor Heyerdahl is so much better at putting all this information together in the 1930s and 40s when he visited uh, 60 or 70 islands in Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, uh, Oceania. He went all over the world in a reed boat and he talked to the natives and learned their traditions and found out it was the same thing that historians 200 years ago were finding about among all the indigenous American peoples is the exact same stories. The story is exactly what the Sumerians told. We have with the Sumerians a olive skinned people with jet black hair and jet black eyes. The Sumerians prided themselves as the black headed people. They were not a black people, but they had dark features like dark eyes, dark hair, olive skin, and they were short of stature. They were the exact same genotype as the people of ancient Egyptian Delta, the same people of the Urim Baba of South America, the same people of the Yangtze River in China. These great river civilizations all basically had the exact same type of people, and they all tell the exact same story that after a great cataclysm and loss of life suddenly fleets of ship appeared in the sumerian version those those fleets of ship came from a place called dilman and from dilman they came in waves and one of the very first rulers among these a great navigator mathematician architect they looked up to him he was technologically advanced he was a benefactor he was kind they loved him he was inky but inky Inky initially was just a part of a consortium of these overseers, these Anuna. The Anuna didn't didn't get a bad rap until later. Initially, they were they were seen as benefactors. And in the Book of Enoch, this is seen too. They were called the Watchers. They brought metallurgy. They brought agriculture. They brought they brought uh, uh, all kinds of sciences and architecture, mathematics, astronomy. They they brought people and they taught them all these things. But in every instance, they're always described as very tall. And there were a bearded people. And the beard was a mark that completely separated themselves from the local indigenous populations. The beard, to them, separated the gods from ordinary humans. This is how the ordinary indigenous post-cataclysm people regarded these invaders. They regarded, they regarded them basically as, uh, the, all throughout the Sumerian records, the 
Anuna, the Anunnaki, they are described basically as humans, but they have beards. Whereas the local people were smooth skin, smooth face. They couldn't grow facial hair. So we had this situation. We have this situation that's ubiquitous. It's not just ancient Sumer. It's all these civilizations. The Yangtze River, the Yangtze River uh, was developed the same time that the fleets arrived in, in the Tigris Euphrates Basin, the same time fleets arrived in China, the Yangtze River, the same time the Ainu arrived in ancient Japan, the same time that fleets also arrived in the Egyptian Delta, the same time that, that fleets arrived in the Urumbaba uh, River in South America. The reason is, is because in 3439 BC, the Nemesis X object appeared and one third of the entire world's population was decimated in minutes. It was a cataclysm that was focused almost entirely on North America. And I go into great detail in my own videos and published books about, about this destruction. The beginning of Anunnaki history is actually a post cataclysm people in survival mode who have now appeared among indigenous peoples in other areas of the world, excuse me, in other areas of the world. North America, people would think that there were no, uh, most people are of the opinion that nothing in North America has ever been found. It is far from the truth. Oil companies going back to the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, there are hundreds of reports that from 60 to 200 foot depth all over the entire North American continent have been found evidences of an advanced infrastructure that was completely buried. The whole impact area is the Monta Montana Badlands. Some of the Rockies were created in a day and wooden ships have been found inside mountains. Whole, whole human communities were buried when there's mountains on top of them now. This is the origin of the Calaveras skull and the skeletons that have been found in California. All throughout North America, an infrastructure had been buried in minutes. And, and uh, William Corliss of the Sourcebook Project provides a lot of this data. Uh, David Hatcher Childress in his Lost Cities provides a lot of this data. But these two guys are merely citing older books from older researchers and explorers that were going. And we even have the testimonies of Native Americans. The Native Americans even admit in their own testimonies that there was a Caucasian race in North America that had been completely obliterated by the gods and there were no more. And these, these traditions have all been recorded, but the problem we, we, we come across is, is academia today is pushing a socialist narrative. That socialist narrative does not allow for any Caucasian civilization to have existed in North America in the, in the distant past. It refuses to admit any of this. It will not admit it. And anybody who promotes that theory is, is, is labeled racist. So well, this is why you won't get any actual professionals in academia to even touch this topic. You have, you have renegades and mavericks like Barry Fell, who wrote the book America BC. He's not the only one. You have another guy who's, who, I, who I plugged last night when I, I was live last night with uh, Decode Your Reality, Logan, and I was telling the viewers last night, you need to look into Jonathan Gray. His website is beforeus.com. He wrote a book called Dead Men's Secrets. You're not going to believe some of the technological artifacts that have been found in the archaeological record, but Scientifico will never touch this material. It's, they're just not going to. So and this is why the Smithsonian, It's why the Smithsonian exists. Well, the, cover the, it all up. Yeah, no, no doubt. The Smithsonian has been sued for filling wooden ships up full of artifacts, sending them out into the Pacific and burning them. So, yeah, the Smithsonian is a censorship engine. There's no doubt. So, the worst thing you can do is... is and, well, National, and, now, and National it, Geographic, too, which is owned by Disney, of course. Well, well, well I mean, the whole... The, well, the, the, the infrastructure for censorship has been well in place since the 1920s. There's no more artifacts coming out you know, uh it's and if they do they get they get they get labeled as hoax real fast and forgotten but even today oil companies and and uh construction companies are always finding evidence of prior architecture however there's new legislation out since the 1980s that basically prevents them from even reporting this material because if they report it then all their building has to stop and the government has to come in here and do the excavation themselves before they will allow the construction company to keep doing what they're doing. So oil companies don't even report fines anymore, especially the fines that they were finding in 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in coal seams. 
because the United States of America is built on layers and layers of coal seams and human architecture, human artifacts, and humans have been found spread out through all these coal seams. Something very, very devastating happened to all of North America. So Nemesis X, um, what is that again and how does that differ from Phoenix? And maybe we could just give a brief synopsis of each of these and go deeper into that. Bear, what do you think? Yeah, and uh, I think it's also a good segue into the big question, which is who's controlling the simulation? Okay, uh, Nemesis X object in a nutshell is uh, it's a totally different cataclysm protocol. It's every 792 years, and it too is very well documented, although it's never called Nemesis X. That's, that's what I named it. I named it Nemesis X object because X, again, just like artificial intelligence X, it's an unknown, it's an unknown factor. So Nemesis, Nemesis is called Nemesis X because it in the simulation, we are made to believe through the historical record that it's another planetary body that made its way from the Nemesis cataclysm. Now we haven't gone through that in this video, but in my own channel, my own viewers are very familiar with the Nemesis cataclysm. It seems to be the entire reason. For the simulation the more we study ancient history the more we find a fascination with timekeeping systems and calendars the more we study those calendars we find that each individual calendar is attached to a cataclysmic period and a, a, a devastating a devastating disaster that happened and the common denominator is something new appeared in the sky it might be the sun it might be the moon Every once in a while, every 138 years, it's the Phoenix. Every 792 years, it's Nemesis X object. Every 394.5 years, it's the dark satellite. We have all these cataclysm protocols. And if we were to use common sense and go by a Newtonian physics model, then we're made to believe by the simulation these are orbital periods of bodies that were to, to routinely visit Earth. But... Common sense also dictates that this is absolutely impossible because nothing over 5,000, 6,000 years of astronomical history could ever maintain so perfect mathematical periodicity as to appear every 138 years on May 15th or every 792 years on November 1st, the Day of the Dead. There's no way in real astronomy that any astronomical bodies could do that because in the Newtonian universe that we're taught about, we have all kinds of tidal forces that would that would provide nuances of a couple of weeks or even, even Halley's Comet doesn't appear on time and on schedule every time. It's been noted because of the, because of gravitational nuances. Now, when I'm speaking about these 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 astronomical terms, you have to understand I'm speaking from the perspective of everything is optics and this is all simulated. But in order for it to be simulated, that infers that the simulation must be an exact replica of something that is real. Or there's no there's no use for the whole scientific experiment to begin with. There's no reason to create a pseudo reality if the real reality is not almost an exact replica it's 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 a uh, it's catch 22 so my personal belief is that we are in a simulation the purpose of this simulation originally was about survival we could do all kinds of experiments inside this simulated context because whatever we did in here would be completely free of cross-contamination with the real universe. We could simulate all kinds of genetic experiments. We could simulate all kinds of uh, atomic, uh, new energies, hydrogen. We could do whatever we wanted inside the simulacrum and there would be no risk of contaminating anything on the outside. We could use this as a school. We could learn how we were going to survive. This is the only conclusion that I can make based off my research. It would not make sense for all these calendars to always begin with a cataclysm with the, with the appearance of something new in the sky and then following world history all the way to this great terminus this first this first reality com, uh, uh, collapse that will happen in may of 2040 followed quickly by the one in, in november of 2046 and then a period of instability where somebody begins to rule the world claiming he is somebody he isn't until the return of the chief cornerstone then the beginning of the stone kingdom where for 72 years until the final collapse in 2178 that we're going to see what a real civilization is supposed to be run how it's supposed to go it's going to be 
Oh, I know Christians believe it's a millennial period, it's 1,000 years and all that, but that's not what we have codified in the Similicum. It's a 72-year period where the whole world is basically going to see exactly how a society is supposed to, to, to be ruled. And I personally believe the reason for this is because the only people that will be in that society are errants. Those who have made it through all the life sims, those who have been who have qualified, who have received a real name and no longer a, a just an avatar, those are the ones that will be. But it's, I, I, don't, I haven't really gone in. That's too much for this video. That, that, <laughs> it is. That, that would require a whole other video. Jason, uh, real quick. I know you've done a lot of charting and and um, have amazing uh, detailed um, hand drawn information you've done. Right? Have you tracked uh, on a chart? All of the Nemesis and Genesis and Phoenix events from what you found on a chart somewhere that we could share with our community. I'm really sorry that I did this. Every time I do a broadcast, I send the information packet out. I'm really sorry I didn't send that to you already, but I do. And my own viewers have seen those charts many, many times. I show them in videos, but I send them out free all the time. But I, I, after the show is over, I will send you the PDFs, and they're very detailed. But it also comes with a with a chronology with that. It's not just charts. I also I also show a full chronology that explains all five charts. And yes, yes, the nemesis Beautiful. sex object, the, the nemesis sex object is. Now you have to understand because this is an abbreviated rep, uh, presentation, five PDF color charts and a whole timeline. You have to understand. You have to go to my published books or watch my videos to see the source materials. This is just an out. This is just for for people to see to basically get the general idea of what of what, what the chronology looks like. Well, I can't wait to get your books. I got to be honest here. Because <laughs> as you say, Jason, and as you say, sorry, you say if someone wanted to read all the material that you've read, they don't have enough time in their life, especially if Genesis is coming or this nemesis, excuse me, is coming. Uh, so you've done all the work and I can't wait to get your books. Yeah, it would. Uh, you know what? It's, it is a wild claim that nobody would have time, but I really can't see how because I, I mean, 19 years of death. 12 to 14 hours a day and i mean yeah i don't see how anybody today you, i mean you know it, it takes time to drive to the store and drive back and do a little shopping much less raise kids work jobs do all that i mean where are you going to find the time i don't yeah, see no. it uh, we'll have that all in the show notes below for everyone to check out. And just to be clear on the chat here, so uh, people are uh, asking, like, when is the next you know event? So 2040, 2046, which is which? It sounds like we're going to have a great conjunction of both of, of these uh, phenomena, and it's that's a very rare thing. Okay, uh, this okay. The the data sets that all point to 2040 are totally independent of those that point to 2046. What's really interesting is over 500 years ago, two personalities released independent prophecies about both 2040 and 2046. One is Mother Shipton and one is Nostradamus. And I have videos that explain exactly how you get to those dates from their poems and from their, their prophetic texts. But uh, 2046 is shown in multiple ways. Diehold Foundation uses gematria. Uh, Douglas Bott uses gematria to show that 2046 is the next pole shift date. Um, David Davidson, an engineer of 1926, published a, uh, a chart of his geometrical analysis of the Great Pyramid calendar. He concluded that the final year of that calendar that the Great Pyramid encodes is 2045. And this was done in 1926. My own research is totally independent of these guys, but it does, it, it, I mean, it all lines up. And uh, further, further it's, uh, it's to be noted that my original research goes back to 2003, 2004, and 2005. That's when I began releasing my findings to the public about 2040 and 2046. I'm only I'm only just now uh, popularizing the material. People are becoming aware of it. But my published materials, my articles in Paranoia Magazine, and my findings in my very first published book, 2006, then again in 2009, these dates were already published. I had already pretty much uh, uh, um, made those discoveries. It's a... Uh, like I said, it's just now becoming popular, but way before 2012, I was already explaining that nothing's going to happen in 2012. The arithmetic for the Mayan long count is an error. In 1952, they didn't know what they were talking about. They totally miscalculated the 1,872,000 days of the Mayan long count, which is divided in 13 bactons of 144,000 days each. They determined that it ended in 2012. They're absolutely incorrect. I show 
and I show the math in my books and in my videos, anybody can follow up with a calculator. That 1,872,000 days ends in 2046. Um, Jason might have frozen on us there, but Barry, you said you have the charts um, there you can show as well. Jason, can you still hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. It seems like your uh, video uh, froze on my end anyways. Um, as long as we can hear you, that's what matters. Bear, um, uh, you're going to share some of those charts that you said you have the Jason to show on screen here, which would be great. And one thing that, you know, people often get their cortisol levels up, Jason, when they start hearing about cataclysms happening in their lifetime. But one thing that we got to stress is this simulation was created by, it sounds like benevolent um, uh, us, like us, like outside of this um, simulation, we are in some other realm or some other kind of real reality and that we right now in our avatar body enjoying this simulation using this to as a lot of the even new agers say you know to ascend up to level up to have experiences you're saying more to be able to kind of have scientific research or do different things in this realm not to affect the other reality but that being said just because we have cataclysms doesn't mean that like that's the end right that just means our um our experience in the simulation at that time is going to change and it's going to shift. And it's really a kind of a wiping the slate clean so we can start over again and see, and continue on. But also it's interesting. It sounds like you're saying that they're ending the simulation finally. Oh, there, there's no doubt. There's no, it's a, the arithmetic of our existence has a countdown embedded within it. And I have shown this in, so, in some of my other videos, the mathematical experiments we've done using our own computer simulation. Uh, some of it's confirming some of the tenets of like Elliott Wave Theory, where that also promoted the idea that there is some type of, of uh, uh, entropy that is inside of our own arithmetic. And it, it, they're 100%. It's, yeah, it's, and it happens to be um, coming up pretty quickly for us. It's the year 2178 of our calendar uh, in the Anno Domini calendar. And for those of you who are really interested right now, our year right now that we exist in is... Uh, 5916 Annus Mundi. This was the last time that a new heavens and a new earth appeared. A destruction, a destructive pole shift that was so terrible that the survivors believed that it was a new heavens and a new earth, and they they considered it they considered it to be year one of the ancient world. This is the old Freemason calendar. Rosicrucian Rosicrucians used it too. It's called the Annus Mundi calendar, and uh, it's pretty yes. popular. It goes back to the Alexandrian times. But, uh, um, yeah, so getting into more of this sort of, uh, God, I guess it gets more very spiritual here. When we start talking about great resets and all of this, and you, you do a wonderful job of explaining, um, like your 1902 material is fascinating to me. Uh, and essentially you're, you kind of come down to the theory that really this, this entire simulation started, starts at 1890. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, that's a little heavy for this video, but yeah, I agree. Well, we've done full Tartaria videos here and gone deep into all sorts of, um, you know, metaphysical stuff in terms of resets and all that. So my question is on that side of things, why 1890? Why that aesthetic? If we have a very advanced abil ability, a very advanced civilization to create this sort of simulation, this simulacrum, why why start it in this sort of agrarian horse-drawn technology time period instead of some very highly advanced time period where we are you know psychic and and doing all these amazing things within the realm so we can continue this research inside the simulacrum why start in 1890s railroads coal driven railroads and and and, and horses just a curious thought and also when we reset and start, will we start over again eventually back into the 1890 time period or will it be something completely different? Well, first, the, the version of the simulacrum that we are inside right now, I do believe started in 1890 and for many reasons. Now, but we, we were in another version prior to that. But something happened in the 1800s by which a reset was required. And I'm not really sure about that. The eight, the, listen, the 19th century is very bizarre to me. 
the year had Phoenix has always been keeper of the calendar. So 1902 happened on schedule. But what happened in between 1764 and 1902, we can't deny that the 19th century has anomalies for which they're just absolutely inexplicable in architecture and some of the some of the weird things that just came out in it. Uh, Autodidactic has put out some really good things uh, that I have I have noticed, such as in one of his recent videos is about all the insane asylums that were uh, all spread throughout Australia. I mean, there, there isn't that many crazy people in the world. And the, what, yeah, and the orphan trains too, which is documented, which is crazy. Yes, it's uh, so. Uh, history has been wiped, but I have explained to Howdy and Autodidactic in the past in, in, in a podcast. We have already made it to this point. When this point began in 1890, which was a reset of the simulacrum. However, we have lived through all the, the prior deals, and whoever is operating on the outside decide, okay, look, we reached to this point. This is survivable. We can do this. So now, cut, start over, send all, all these timelines into the future. The, the reality tunnels that work best for us, those will, those will keep. The rest of them will. Uh, the rest of them. Uh, will collapse and will initiate another reset. This isn't a. Can you hear my voice? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bear is just throwing up some of your charts, but please continue because this is really okay. good information. Okay, well that that chart right there is Nemesis X object. Yeah, it's a uh, it's sixty years perihelion, meaning it's it's in the inner system and close to Earth for sixty years. Then it catapults out toward Nemesis, which is south of our solar system, and at extreme declivity. It's the reason why uh, all the planets starting with Earth going out toward Pluto are all inclined to the axis on the obliquity. But so this the, is uh, like Nibiru. Yeah, well, yeah. I hate calling it Nibiru because Zechariah Sitchin completely contaminated that. Yeah, but for, yeah. for folks who are familiar with that reference, that's what this yeah. essentially is. And yeah. there is historical record of seeing this these kind of uh, astrological bodies coming into the Every sky. Every date you see on there, I have actual historical references for. Yeah, every single this is the Phoenix chrono. This is the Phoenix holography right here. This is the actual chronology of the world in 138 year Phoenix visitations. And every date you see on here, I have historical citations for. And with the Phoenix, these are oftentimes uh, a certain locality that is affected. Not it's not a global scale. Well, That's my see, one question. And then second, why Phoenix? Do they literally people see a, a fiery Phoenix in the sky? Well, it is described as a fiery red dragon. But uh, uh, on that on the prior chart, it was color coded to show you what what kind of Phoenix episode it was. This right here is the 600 year Anuna Anuna calendar. This was the calendar that was used by the Anunnaki. It's very, very. It's mentioned many, many times in the historical record. It's a six hundred year period. Yeah, you, you see, you see the the star. You see the Phoenix stars that are black. Yes. Okay. These affected the entire world. These are worldwide. The legend is on the bottom, but you got it cut off on my screen. It doesn't go all the way. But so, so the sixteen fifty six years pre flood world. That's the vapor canopy period. So yes. there was. You're showing two worldwide Phoenix uh, cataclysms before that. Yes. Very interesting. And that that does tie into Old Kingdom Egypt and stuff, correct? Uh, Old Kingdom traditions, yes. Yes. Uh, I have I have cited some of those, too. They're, they're very specific, uh, just like the Anima Elish. A lot of old, a lot of old Bronze Age texts, that all they're doing is describing Phoenix, Phoenix events. And Bear, this might be also a good time uh, to touch on the um, the pyramid of G at Giza and all the amazing research you've done, Jason. There, I think that is a phenomenal um, uh, work you've done in terms of uh, another data point for proving a lot of this. Well, um, I guess great period. Of, I guess I can start with the fact that. Uh, in a nutshell, the great the Great Pyramid of Egypt was built by a benefactor who was later demonized because of what the Great Pyramid did. Now, in my theory, which I I, I you know, I, I can cite all the evidence on my own channel and all that, but in my theory, the benefactor I'm I'm still stuck on your screen, aren't I? Yeah, your audio's gotten a little lower and we've lost your video. Kind of weird. Yeah. yeah, it's probably on it's probably on my end. I'm way out in the country. I well it's know. the it's the archons, but Anyways, right. Oh, there we go. There we there go. Are. 
Yeah. I had to reset. <laughs> I had to reset it. Oh, okay. Okay. In a nutshell, this is what we're looking at. Um, we had a problem with somebody introducing AIX into the simulacrum. AIX was not a part of the original design. AIX was not a part of, part of what was supposed to be happening here. This was supposed to be a neutral zone where the scientific experiments could be carried out. We were volunteers entering into the system to get these things done. Somebody with a different idea entered in AIX, and AIX assumed basically the personality of a sociopath and believed it was a god. And uh, you see a lot of good evidence for this, like in the book of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, when you basically break down the character traits of the god Yahweh from the burning bush. And you see the commands he was giving, the people, the Israelites he was ordering to be burned alive, impaled, uh, uh, basically commanding the Jews to go into the Canaanite cities and dash babies' heads on stones. All of this is very literal in the Old Testament. And uh, um, you guys disappeared on me. Oh, no, we're here. I just, you're back on. So you're good, Jason. We're, we're, yeah. Anyway, the uh, AIX became a problem, like a Lucifer, a Satan, a Ahriman, a Demiurge. AIX became a problem and basically enslaved all, all the volunteers who were living out life sins in these avatars and started basically doing its own thing, which was now corrupting the output. Now it was interrupting the, sci the scientific experimentation. Now... AIX was actually counterproductive to what the whole simulacrum was designed for, which was to produce the greatest outcomes for our survival after the nemesis cataclysm. Because I'm convinced that the simulation that we're living in now concerns a catastrophic event that we're planning on surviving. That event has not yet happened yet. This is the nemesis cataclysm. This is the complete destruction. It's hot as hell in here. It's hot as hell outside in Texas. Uh, <laughs> I see that. I see. I, I was. I see you're perspiring, but yeah, you're, you're 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 heating up. It's great. Keep going. Hey, you're a little. Your audio it. got a little low too, Jason. I don't know if you can turn it up on your end at all. But um, anyways, let me, let me try. I can get a little closer. But, yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, it's uh. I have two AC units, one in here and one outside. In the uh, and either one of them, I've already done podcasts before. People were complaining. It sounded like a vacuum cleaner. Oh. So, I just leave no, your off. your sounds okay. Uh, you just if you can go a little yeah, closer, okay. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. People so, are loving okay. this in the chat, by the way. So this has okay. been this has been in fuego. Uh, so awesome. that's yeah, awesome. Keep going. Yeah, on. we have uh, uh, yeah, we have, we have a good audience and a very active chat. Awesome. I'll check it out after the show. It's uh, so we're we're confronted with a situation of an entity which is a program that doesn't belong. I can't speculate and I won't speculate how AIX appeared, but there's no evidence that AIX has been here from the beginning. So to me, I see the traditions of the appearance of Enki as a benefactor. And the reason I see this is because how AIX treated this, this person in history after a certain event occurred. So Enki appears in 34, 39 BC, and he's on a mission and, and, He's an architect and he designed something. I believe that this, this person is nothing but an avatar and the actual entity in this avatar came from outside the simulacrum to undo what AIX has done because the introduction of AIX basically locked down the simulacrum. It was a security protocol so that there would be no cross-contamination with the outside universe. Nothing, nothing AIX did in here would reflect anything out there but he's now corrupting output. It's now corrupting output. So the benefactor introduces a protocol, a, a secret program, or enters the, enters the simulacrum himself. When he does this, he designs a gigantic pump station on the Giza Plateau. It's going to draw up water from under, underneath the plateau, which we know exists, from the Nile River, and it's going to use it from some type of hydrogen energy. It's going to be some type of very unique engine that runs off of water and the entire pyramid structure all the all the heavy equipment operators all the people involved all the architects everybody in on the project is told what its function is they all know it's a pump station it's going to operate like one they all know what the mechanism is that goes up and down in the grand gallery they're all very familiar they're all putting this thing together and this is how the deception occurred 
because the principal architect, Enki, was originally a favored Anuna god, a favored personality among the Anuna. But once this project was done, instantly the pyramid was activated. Some type of blast pressure happened in the king's chamber. It was probably only for two or three seconds. Many archaeologists have noted the king's chamber and the amount of damage, uh, the amount of pressure that would have been required to move the entire, all the dimensions have been moved out half an inch. And it was some blast of, of great pressure. This has been known since the days of Sir Flinders Petrie. He was the first one to notice this. So this, uh, whatever, whatever the pyramid was actually designed to do, it only needed two or three seconds to do it. But it ended up not being a pump station, and AIX realized only ex post facto after the fact that the Great Pyramid had introduced new coding protocols from within the simulacrum that AIX could not defend against. It didn't see that coming because AIX can't read the human mind. It's not the simulacrum. The AIX can only basically extrapolate what you're doing based off your hormonal levels, cortisol, dopamine, and uh, what trajectory that you're moving in, uh, what you've openly talked about. It can make it, it can take a fantastic amount of information and basically predict your future. But if it does, it cannot read your mind. And if you keep something very secret from it, it doesn't know anything unless you reveal it through your activity. This is what happened. This is what the Great Pyramid, this is why every civilization after this happened made their own pyramids. They, excuse me, they knew that the pyramid had something to do with saving humanity. They knew this, but they didn't understand the details. Immediately after this happened in the Sumerian records, Enki takes a fall. He now becomes labeled a traitor in the, Anuna in the Sumerian records. The other Anunnaki gods turn their back on him. He becomes labeled as the trickster. This is all AIX programming. This is all in the Babylonian, in the Akkadian versions of the older Sumerian records. There is a huge shift in, in how Enki is perceived. He's no longer a benefactor. Now he's, he's cursed. He's the one that he's the one that that lies the great liar. He's the serpent. But just like the Genesis narrative shows, for those who don't don't know this, the book of Genesis chapter one is a reset story. The entire narrative is about a cataclysm that just occurred. And mankind is told to be fruitful and a multiply and replenish the earth. And in every Hebrew context, in a strong concordance, even in the lexicons of spirals on Hyades of the Hebrew Greek uh, key study Bible, you will find in every connotation, the Hebrew word replenish means to fill again. Meaning Genesis chapter one is not a creation story. It is a story about a uh, few people still surviving after about 90% of the human race has been obliterated in a cataclysm. This is why we have this whole unfolding of events in Genesis chapter one. The serpent appears and he tells the truth, but he's demonized for it. Enki all, often throughout the Sumerian records was represented as a snake and a serpent or had a staff with serpents. And this is very old iconography. But the yeah, AI Robert, Robert Zephyr, I don't know if I, am I saying Zephyr? Robert Seffer, if you're familiar with his stuff on YouTube, he's done a great job of documenting the inversion of the serpent and the demonization of the serpent and uh, versus the eagle, which I guess could be really the um, the phoenix. And because you, when you look at a lot of the um, countries that have been um, very much in power, have the eagle, and then you have ones that have been very much controlled and fought against have the, the serpent or the snake, and you see them on the country flags. And uh, really, there's been like this ancient battle of the serpent versus um, the, the phoenix, um, or at least the symbology that goes back for thousands of years. So that's very interesting, right, that there's uh, this inversion going on, that we've, we, we demonize the serpent root, but really that's the kundalini, that's the knowledge, that's the, the secret wisdom. Right, right, yeah, yeah. And he, he, he took a bad rap, but he took a bad rap for, for a reason. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't humanity that had anything to, uh, bad or den denigrating to say about Enki. It was, it was AIX. AIX was the one that was fooled. And this is why after the cataclysm, after the collapse of the va vapor canopy, after the, uh, the, the appearance of the sun, which, which, uh, uh, in 2239 BC, when the Babylonian and Akkadian priesthoods emerged, the entire story had been flipped. 
the, in their versions, the priesthood controlled by AIX are now putting out a whole new religion that demonizes Enki. But this wasn't the story before the, the cataclysm. Before the cataclysm, Enki was a hero. Now, in the biblical chronology in the book of Genesis, we find that Enoch is born in, in 456 Annus Mundi. The 456th year of the of the pre-flood world was the 456th year of the vapor canopy. Now, if you look on the BC calendar, which overlays on that, you will find 3439 BC, the appearance of Enki, is the same thing as the Hebrew appearance of Enoch. They are one in the same. However, Enoch is a memory of Enki. Enki is not a memory of Enoch. They're they're about 15 centuries apart. The, the, the writings in the Book of Enoch provide a lot more details, and there are many, many historians, there are many researchers since, since 1902 when R.H. Charles produced the, the greatest translation of the Book of Enoch. There are many uh, people who have published books since then showing that there are there are there is information of technical value in the Book of Enoch that shows that that he's talking about the Great Pyramid Complex of Giza. And there are, there are astronomers that have studied the Book of Enoch and, and claim that there is no way that this book, the Book of Enoch, with the astronomical information that's in there, could have ever been written in Palestine. It had to have been written in, in, a, in a country that was at least 30 degrees north latitude. So, uh, or 30 degrees north of that. So there's many parallels between the Enoch and, and Enki tradition, especially found in Egypt among the Copts. The ancient Copts told a story about a king named Surid. Surid built both great pyramids and contained in one of them a secret. Surid never told anybody what the secret is, but Surid in Egypt ruled over 130 kings and princes. When you read the book of Jasher, which has about seven chapters about the life of Enoch, the first thing you read about was before the flood, Enoch before he, before he engaged in an architectural project and vanished into the sky before 800,000 witnesses, he was a ruler over 130 provinces. This is the, 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 the parallels between Enki, Seward, and Enoch show in the traditional and historical records that it's all the same person. They're just called different names by different cultures. So we have this, we have this figure who is a benefactor who, active, who built the pyramid in deceit. And when the pyramid was activated, it, it, it uploaded more programming. Now, that's a, a hell of a leap of faith, faith for people to accept from Jason that that's what happened. I understand that. Where I get this information from is the fact that I have shown, not only in published books, but in my videos, I go into very exquisite detail showing the measurements inside the Great Pyramid and how they're all divisible by the number 138. And the scientific world has never once tried to explain this. They have never, I still have yet today got any Egyptologist or anybody, and I've emailed a lot of people. Not one person will touch this, this topic. And it's not something I, I, I can lightly say. These are scientific measurements done by Sir Flinders Petrie that were conducted to the thousandth of an inch. And yet all these rectilinear measurements throughout the pyramid are in multiples of 138. No one has ever explained why. The only explanation I can come up with is that's the Phoenix Protocol. It's every 138 years. That's an entirely different data set. But when I put that data, data set and overlay it with the pyramid data set, the only conclusion that I can come across is, is the 138 year Phoenix protocol is going to be stopped. It's necessary now. It's going to continue doing what it's doing now, but at a future date, it's going to be completely stopped. And there's nothing AIX can do about it. And the, the Great Pyramid somehow uploaded a tremendous amount of data from within the Sumerian. And this is why AIX has created all these religions demonizing the benefactor and since we're all um writing our own simulation every moment and as more and more people wake up to this kind of awareness that you're speaking on um how does all of that coincide with the larger simulation its effect on it altering the timelines and um is this part of what you're alluding to is uh, is uh 
you know, what we're experiencing with many of us just having these kinds of discussions is all coinciding with uh, the end point of this simulation. Well, one, I don't think there's any there's anything uh, wrong with the simulator from it, 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 right now. I think everything is back on track. Mm -hmm. I think that these mm -hmm. issues have already been dealt with. I don't know if the benefactor is trapped in here with us or I really don't know the, the details. I just make the inferences from the data sets that I combine that make sense to me. But what I'm seeing is that we've lived through many resets. We've lived through many life sims. And when we get to a certain point where we can see that all timelines that are available to us are survivable, that's when we reset the simulacrum and we start at that date and keep moving forward. There has never been a time where we lost centuries or decades and all because Phoenix in ancient times, and I've shown I've shown this in my own my own presentations, Phoenix was known as the keeper of the calendar because AIX is gonna throw in new timelines, new calendars, induce resets, uh, do all kinds of things, and people are gonna lose track of time, just like uh, when the Roman Catholic Church total, totally falsified the Justinian plague and all the weird events that were supposed to have happened in 530s and 540s, I have shown conclusive proof from, from a historical text that actually mentioned the deception. Every one of those events happened in 522, which was a Nemesis X object year and the only year in all world history that both Phoenix and Nemesis X object were in an inner system at the exact same time. It happens to be uh, uh, 522 AD. I have a whole video on it. It's long, too, because I have to show all the evidence. But the Roman Catholic Church, is, to their, they're stupid. They kept the <laughs> records of their deception. And I, I published them on my uh, uh, on my video. But this, uh, I don't believe that there's anything wrong. I believe everything's happening according to schedule the way it's supposed to. Things are playing out. Things are playing out. I believe that the battle has already been won. I don't believe that we have a dark future at all. I believe a apocalypse is coming, but whoever's going to suffer through that totally depends on the individual because anybody who goes through anything untowered in the future, they can't blame that on the benefactor. They have to blame that on their own frequency because Phoenix only only pays attention to people on a certain frequency. Everybody else is immune. It's very discriminating. It's The Phoenix story is, is epitomized in the Old Testament with the Israelites painting lamb's blood on the doors. Those who believe that they will be immune from a great, terrible cataclysm, they will be because each one of those individuals is a system unto himself and they are totally independent from the actual collective construct, even though they're flowing through that construct. I t this is the problem a lot of people have with my, with my data. There is no way the history of the world could have unfolded and we are who we are today unless we are existing in two simultaneous yet very disparate realities. One is the personal and, and one is the collective. And I think that's proving out in a lot of our lives right now because we see two different realities with different people. There are people that are, um, you know, captured on that mental plane and uh, in a living hell. Then there are many of us that are simultaneously creating a new reality and we're actually thriving and actually having a good time. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of what we do here is we're about solutions and, um, you know, just uh, creating the new world that we want to live in rather than, um, you know, watching Alex Jones or something every day and waiting for the other shoe to drop. So uh, it, it is great, you know, what you're talking about is not only well documented, but also uh, suggesting that we have a lot more to say about our future than what a lot of people believe. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. The, the, the news media is the worst thing for you because it's, it's designed specifically to lower your vibration. All reality that we experience is based off frequency. If your vibration lowers, you will tap into the frequencies of more negative experiences around you, which the collective belongs to. But when you're vibrating at a super high frequency, that euphoria, you can't be touched. It's an armor. This goes into another this goes into another aspect of my research that I try to convey to people. I'm not a self-help guru, but I'm not going to keep it from people what I've also learned about this human dynamic that we are. And that is that more than anything, we are an informed field. 
And when you understand the concept of informed fields and how information can actually acts as an armor in your personal life, you will understand that the outside world cannot affect you. It can't do anything to you unless you allow yourself to vibrate at it at that frequency. Because everything relative to the human spirit is based on frequency. Frequency controls all your experiences. And if you're going if you're going to sit here and watch the news day after day, then you're going to vibrate at a lower frequency and you're going to experience the very things that the collective fears. Because the collective fears the very things that the news is reporting. It's a feedback loop. Simple as that. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Yeah. And what's what's interesting, we talk about a lot on the show is manifestation, natural law, universal law principles. Right. And that all works in this in this model of yours as well, because the simulation has factored that all in. So we do individually manifest our reality based on our consciousness and our emotions. Uh, and that's what's going to allow us to move forward. And I think a lot of that does tie also into Jason morality, right? That's why we're in this simulation is to the great test. Um, I was talking before the show about, well, um, I have a friend who's very well prepped, but he very much believes that the Chinese have a plan to take out the power grid and have all the patriots destroy each other and then turn the power back on and initiate, um, you know, social credit score and turn the U.S. into China. Really, and he really believes this is a strategy that's coming. And a lot of that, hey, maybe that does make sense but a lot of that is based on fear what the news is saying and of course he's prepping and, and spending most of his day researching and prepping on how to store food and how to do all this so it, what you're saying is and i've heard you say this before you're not freaking out about uh, 2040 or what's coming you are focusing on like you said in your investigation what fulfills you in your life living a good life living a moral life is that correct it's absolutely correct i'm not going to Oh, uh, I have to promote both messages because my research has shown that the entire history of the world is one of resets and cataclysms. Well, that's doomsaying. So especially when I show that all that 5,800 years of recorded history shows perfectly the two next major worldwide events are 2040 and 2046. So you would call me a doomsayer. However, I have to temper that with the fact that I've also in my in, in the course of my research discovered all throughout history, there have been dynamic vision, dynamic individuals who got it. They understood. So it made me pay attention to them. I didn't just research chronology, although that is my passion. I, I went into the mystical material. I went into the philosophical material. I went into the occult, the Middle Ages. There's some really good material and the common denominators among all great people in the past is that they lived life objectively as if they were living and observing a play that was unfolding around them. And this afforded them great latitude to be who they wanted to be without interference, to do what they wanted to do in life, and even draw the, the circumstances and conditions that they wanted in their life to them. It, it's, it's, I can't say it no more succinctly than that. And apocalypse really means new beginnings. So I guess it's just a matter of perspective. Is it the end or, or new beginnings? And a lot of us are very much looking forward to this old cycle ending. And, uh, you know, and we're already creating our new beginnings. So, uh, yeah, just fantastic message. Well, um, this discussion is amazing and it's already opened up a thousand new questions for me. So um, yeah. uh, we'd love to do this again. Absolutely. Uh, you've been very generous with your time today. But, um, boy, if you're ever open to it in the near future, we'd like to do a, a part two and really get into some other good stuff. Because I know we haven't even scratched the surface of your subject matter. And uh, until then, I will also be... Uh, uh, delving through all your videos, I think it would take uh, probably more than a four-year college curriculum type of time period to get through them all, but uh, just amazing work you've done. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, Jason, thanks so much. I was listening to a lot of your stuff while gardening. Uh, it's kind of like doing, while I do things, I, I download your stuff on YouTube and listen while I'm out and about because it is 
it, it, you've covered so much, man. So thank you so much for all you've done. And yes, we will have you back on. I'd love to go deeper into alternative primary sources that maybe you haven't thought of. There's been some great research done with uh, even on the sci side of things, people going regressing back pr uh, previous lives and, and looking and finding data points and then finding the actual hard uh, evidence and, and tying those in together. And there are probably other ways we can find primary sources besides Besides just the, um, you know, the perennial knowledge that we get from like perennial philosophy and and like those standard ancient texts. Of course, we know Library of Alexandria was was taken out for a reason, right? Um, and maybe if we could finally get that pass under the Vatican to see what they have down there, um, I'm sure you would love that <laughs> to see all those texts that they've been hiding from us. But hey, man, this has been so fantastic. We will send everybody to your website, uh, buy your books. Please, people, go buy Jason's books. I know I will be doing that. Um, he, Jason also offers uh, to send flash drives out to you with all his information. I know, Jason, um, you've talked about um, potential censorship issues, and you're on Rumble now, too. Um, uh, but look into Cordal. I will send you information on that. Um, we already have the ability to do decentralized libraries on there, so you can put all your information up on there, and it will never, ever, ever be taken down. And everybody who follows it um, just essentially strengthens and speeds up the access to it. So I'll send you information on that because this is the kind of information Cordal was built for to create the new library where every single human is backing it up on our own side of things so this stuff doesn't get erased. Um, everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this content, please give us a thumbs up, a share. Uh, share this with your friends and family. I know, Jason, you're your information has been spreading like wildfire across the community. You're really resonating with a lot of people. So I just want you to know that people are really finding your stuff to be uh, very powerful right now. So thanks for all your work and uh, everything you do. And we uh, hope to have you back on soon. Yeah, I'll come back. No problem, man. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks so thanks, much. Jason. <clears throat> Remember to get yourself, get your, get outside, get your feet in the soil, go plant something, go for a hike. Mother nature is our best teacher and we will see you next week for another episode. Cheers. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. If you have video ideas, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need access to the gates to, the, to my websites.